Welcome everyone then. So welcome to our lecture series of the ERA chair on e-governance and digital public services. So it's a particular, uh, particular honor for me to welcome Dan Bogdanov uh, for this uh, talk. Dan, for those of you who don't know him, is actually the inventor of ShareMind, a secure multi-party computation system for collecting, sharing, and processing private data. And with this new kind of uh, uh, computer analysis, it allows actually to process the digital data without seeing the individual values. And that is really something that uh, has inspired many also to think about privacy in a different way or actually uh, enabling privacy in a new way. And uh, without further ado, I'm very honored that Dan is with us today. And I give the floor to Dan to uh, start his talk about privacy and security technologies for data-driven policymaking. Thank you so much, uh, Robert Ellis and uh, the whole university team and everyone who's listening. Indeed, I'm Dan, I'm from um, Cybernetica. Uh, Cybernetica, just one slide on, so that everybody knows what that is. We're something, we like to call ourselves a knowledge intensive, small, medium enterprise. Uh, actually, we started as an applied research unit of the Institute of Cybernetics like 1960s, we date back to those times. It was, um, uh, the company wasn't there yet, but as a private separate company, we were established in 1997. So we have a big, uh, big birthday coming up next year. Uh, currently we're 24 years old as a company, which is pretty good you know, by Estonian standards. Uh, but yes, we are a sort of a spin-off of the Academy of Sciences, and that has created a very interesting organizational culture where uh, we're still writing papers. We have a whole institute, uh, about 35 people. I'm the director of the institute. We do research for um, US uh, funders, European funders, Estonian funders, and so on. And we also act as a sort of a think tank on uh, e-government and uh, digital identity and uh, data protection technologies. So 10% uh, of our employees have PhD degrees, various domains, mostly cryptography, security, math, but also physics here and there. And uh, we're very international. We, are, we have spent quite a lot of time exporting the beautiful dream of Estonian e-government piecewise because you can't export the whole country, you can just export parts of it. And um, uh, we aim to be good uh, partners also for our private sector customers. So, but let's first, it's party time. We have had 20 years of X-Road, uh, 17th, December 2001, deployment started. The development had already gone uh, on before, but uh, who counts that? And that was still the TD Yasida Ministerium, or the Ministry of Roads and uh, Communication, who, and the State Information System Department. There wasn't still a State Information Systems Agency back then. Uh, it was, times were different. And uh, cybernetic's part in building X-Road was exactly the cryptography and the security side of things. And that, from that, I will start uh, with some of the motivating introductions of my lecture today. So the question, to centralize or decentralize governmental data? And that is something that uh, quite a few governments, uh, government CIOs have been tackling over the last years. And um, some of them uh, read uh, the papers that Dark University has written and that we have written, and some of them don't read them. And uh, it is very sad that some of them don't read them, uh, but and even, and, and that creates two sorts of problems. First is that they are not making use of all the good research, all the good experience that other countries have had. Uh, and the second is that they get a false idea of what Estonia does. I've been, I've seen on uh, social media how certain German data protection people are saying that, ah, but that's Estonia. They can have these services because they don't have any data protection requirements which could not be <laughs> more incorrect. 
But um, there's a certain perception that you can only build the kind of services you have in Estonia if you have a big central database. And that's an incorrect perception. And we've, um, uh, whenever we can, we try to convince people otherwise. But think of it for a moment then. Assume that you have ministries, you have government agencies, um, whether you have databases for cars, people, uh, disease, uh, like healthcare, health records, uh, firearms, uh, ships, what really? And then the thing is that do you pull them all together? Do you have a big house with uh, lots of armed guards who are uh, protecting the server farms inside, which have all the data? Or do you build a solution where you have a distributed architecture where the mini each ministry, each agency keeps track of their own information. And uh, if you want to build a service on top of them, you have some sort of communication. So Estonia obviously has gone for the distributed approach with Xroad, where the Xroad is a network. It's sort of like another internet on top of the internet that ensures that you can have secure government transactions uh, which are usable as evidence in court, if need be. And that has gotten us very far. And the security analysis arguing for this, arguing for a centralized solution is also uh, 20 years old. And it comes from the master's thesis of Arne Ansper, e-government from a security viewpoint. And uh, there Arne argued that for security reasons, you should distribute and have a distributed platform. And there are certain myths being told about that time. One of the myths is that uh, the government actually was procuring a centralized system and uh, it had an annex. The procurement documentation had an annex which was a security analysis arguing for a decentralized solution. So it was a sort of a conflicting, um, a conflicting procurement but uh, a consortium which also did include Cybernetica 1 and thus we got a distributed version. Arne is uh, still uh, one of the, Arne is a Cybernetica employee from day one. He's our um, chief, uh, chief technology officer, let's say. And, and he's still, he's still uh, uh, very vocal about this and helps uh, build e-governments elsewhere. Turned out that the whole thing of distribution was great for data protection too, because it didn't um, aim for super databases and none were built. Uh, although it depends on how you look at things, uh, UK or certain German people, French as well, would argue that our population registry is a scary database because it has all the people and everybody has numbers and these numbers can be used to link. And we'll get back to that. But now uh, technology has developed and we have gotten to a point where data science is the coolest thing. And it is one of the next big jumping, uh, jumping opportunities for quality. Uh, so pulling data together is again a temptation. And that comes quite a lot from the fact that the data science as taught in universities focuses on data collection. So the first thing you're taught is how to collect data, how to clean it up, and it all assumes that you have all the data in one place. The tools of today give you a mental model, meaning that you have to have data in one place. So the question is obvious that how do you collect data in a decentralized um, infrastructure? So again, uh, we have organizations who are saying that we will be the stewards of centralized data. Uh, Statistics Estonia is a great example. They do have a lot of data and uh, they're still missing some. They don't have, I think, all the tax data and they don't have uh, people's mobility data, which they're trying to get uh, very desperately by trying to rewrite the laws. So they're one of the people with temptation on having all the data in the government. And the question is, uh, are we going to lose the 20 years uh, we had? And are we going to get in trouble with uh, data protection? And yes, we might. So today is about how we could avoid that. So I have two, three stories for you. I will, uh, and uh, uh, I'm 
trying to talk through pictures, meaning that uh, I will have pictures and I'll based on time, see how much of, about each story I can tell you. First of all, I'm going to go over a story that is old and that many of you know, but it's sort of, um, it's sort of where a lot of this got real for us. Uh, you, might, uh, you might know as um, researchers that uh, graduation is hard and getting students to actually come and do academic work is hard. So this is from back in the day where um, some social scientists uh, worked out that uh, IT students are really bad at graduating. And the universities had the uh, somewhat well found <laughs> a good foundation to think that it was because all the students are being hired by the IT companies to implement cool software. The companies, uh, the Estonian Association of uh, Information and Communication Technology, which is an umbrella organization for all the IT companies, the telcos and so on, was uh, quick to argue that uh, if a student is lazy, then uh, won't graduate anyway, and it's just, uh, it's not their fault. Right, so at one of the meetings of the same um, ITL, the Estonian IT Companies Agency, the idea was formed that maybe if we could link together records, governmental records on uh, working and studying, we could have a nice nice result and we could find if there is a relation between graduating on time or not graduating on time and working during the study period. So for that, you would need uh, information from the tax and customs office. Uh, has a person worked and working is defined as, pay, as um, taxes being paid on salaries. So that's a good enough uh, definition of working for that study which period and whether it was an IT company, the tax records have all of that, fortunately. And from the Ministry of Education and uh, Science, you could get the study related events, enrollments, uh, graduations, and was it an IT curriculum? Uh, linking that together could have been done in a number of ways. Uh, tax office was only giving out aggregated data, like grouped, where all the more unique configurations of demographic uh, records, the students were thrown out of the statistics. You couldn't get data on them uh, because of uh, tax secrecy. Uh, data protection regulation was still, it was still pre-GDPR, but the data protection was already a thing. And uh, that was also a concern. So uh, indeed the ShareMind technology, uh, and there are, if, there, if the slides ever get distributed, then there are research paper references underneath the slides. So if people want to read up, then they have a chance. So uh, the ShareMind system, and I will skip all the technology today, and we'll have a separate lecture on that if you prefer, uh, is for building services with end-to-end -end data protection. Think of it like, can we do analytics like we do online banking? Uh, if you send a command to your bank, then nobody in the middle will know what, how much money you have or how much you're transferring to where. The bank will know, you will know, but uh, nobody in the middle has to. So ShareMind is sort of like that, but for analytics. You put some encrypted data on, on the way, somewhere there's an analyst. Uh, the analyst says which kind of um, operations are done and uh, the data are not decrypted for that analysis. You'll do the linking, sorting, uh, statistics, everything while the data is encrypted and you'll get an encrypted result, which you can decrypt. But instead of getting the same raw data back, you get a result back. So that is, uh, that is a, it has its uh, restrictions. Exploratory data analysis is hard. The analyst, analyst cannot just you know, look at the records. They have to like, work uh, through gloves in a closed box, like uh, on something radioactive or uh, something very precious, both of which data can be if um, handled incorrectly. And ShareMind is a sort of a system that allows for that. So uh, I'll skip the technical details. Uh, the study was run on data from the Ministry of Education and Research and the Estonian Tax and Customs Board with three organizations um, hosting the encrypted data. 
Uh, why three? That comes down to the technical choices made then, uh, the use of homomorphic secret sharing and secure multi-party computation. Note the multi-party, meaning that the kind of encryption used required multiple organizations as hosts. Uh, the source data was about around 10 million tax records and over half a million education records. Uh, government agencies and Cybernetica were hosting the ShareMind MPC system. Uh, the data owners used import tools to upload the data and encryption was applied on premises, meaning that encrypted data never left the organizations. And thus we argued that data never existed outside the source organization in an unencrypted form. Step two was that um, social scientists from the Estonian Center of Applied Research, CENTAR, uh, many of them with the University of Tartu economics uh, background, had put together a study plan. And this we had implemented on um, a statistics tool called RMind, which is slight of tries to mimic the popular R data analysis tool, but all the operations are done on data while it's encrypted. And it also has another interesting thing. It prevents um, all queries which are outside of the pre-agreed study plan, which is, uh, can be a major restriction, and uh, so it was. But it also gives the data owner certain guarantees that if data has been collected for a singular purpose, then it will be used for that singular purpose, which made uh, legal people very happy. Because all this had to be run by the Data Protection Authority, the um, uh, oversight supervision people at the Tax and Customs Board, and everybody had to agree that this was proper. And it, uh, it took a while uh, to get all these agreements, but it was done. And the study was done, and research uh, results were reached. And um, it was the first large-scale deployment of a technology, and one of my colleagues in Cybernetica said that it was like putting the first satellites into orbit. You basically had to fix the launch vehicle while it was going up. And indeed, uh, we are very thankful for the social scientists at Centaur who st stood with us um, while we were fixing stuff on the go. Uh, you can imagine what the results were. Uh, but the thing was that we could not find a clear relation between working during studies and not graduating. There were some other interesting things we found, though. Yeah, one of them was that um, the working rates of the case group, which was IT students, and the control group, which was non-IT students, were pretty similar. Actually, like non-IT students were working like the same ratios. Possibly there's a difference. Uh, we didn't have it in the study plan to check whether the non-IT students were working as waiters or programmers. So we don't know that. So it could be a difference between what were their uh, jobs. Uh, we still saw that graduation rates were about 20% for IT and 40% for non-IT, which is uh, twice the difference. And that's pretty significant. What we also saw was that uh, the 2008 financial crisis was within our study period. We saw that more IT students went uh, uh, stopped working. The drop in uh, the working rates for IT students was much higher than uh, for the non-IT students. And I possibly should have given you the diagrams here. My apologies uh, for not being there. I can provide you a copy of the Centaur research report if that's interested. interesting. There's a, it's published on the web, uh, on their website. So what was the follow-up of that? Uh, there were some legal papers written about the precedents created. And uh, because GDPR wasn't still, was still fresh then, then some even some German scholars from Göttingen uh, with good ties to Tartu University and to Estonia actually wrote a paper arguing that uh, multi-party computation as used in this study would be anonymous processing, meaning that no personal data was being processed. The same position was supported by the Estonian Data Protection Authority, 
And um, yes, then GDPR court cases started to happen. And uh, in one of their cases, uh, basically the interpretation of GDPR changed in a way that didn't really allow for this kind of uh, innovation. Instead, what happened was that this kind of a study would fall under the joint controllers um, paradigm in GDPR, meaning that there is still someone in charge of what kind of processing happens. Okay, you might not have personal data in the system, but you still have processing, meaning you have controllers and processors. So uh, that would fall today under joint controllers and whether the data is um, personal or not, uh, or it's anonymous, that's an interesting risk, uh, risk analysis question that uh, there are no general uh, answers for. We're still performing research and writing papers on how this, um, how it could actually be beneficial for the European data economy. If we could get a statement that under certain conditions, if there are like really a lot of uh, risks reduced, then it could be considered anonymous because GDPR defines anonymous data as data for which re-identification has been made infeasible uh, without a clear definition of what infeasible means. But um, yeah, so uh, I'm skipping some of the legal stuff today. Uh, for that, we, we should get the tree in seal in front of this audience and she could tell you about all the legal work she has done in that direction. Uh, there, was, uh, some, there were some follow-up studies like analyzing the labor market um, survival or uh, performance of pupils with special educational needs. And that was also using some tax data and education data. So people who have special educational needs, uh, are they, does the education system prepare them well enough so they can get proper jobs and maintain those jobs in their uh, grown up life? And uh, that also happened. And there were some technical advantage, advances there, like things were deployed on actual public clouds, some of the ShareMind hosts and so on. And it was, um, it was another success story, also published, also run by Centaur. It hasn't become the standard methodology. And uh, there's, there's a whole separate discussion of why, which we can have later uh, in a discussion slot. But let's go forward. Uh, let's go to the topic du jour, which is COVID-19. Um, you can't these days have a crisis without technology people jumping in to solve it uh, with technology. That's the sort of um, thing technology people do. So uh, once we got COVID-19 and people started understanding how it transmits, then there were like at least three, three main classes of ideas. First of all would be how to, have, uh, how to know if people are following the restrictions. How do we know that people are actually staying home if there's a curfew uh, or a stay at home order? So how do we know that people are moving around less? For that, you can use uh, cell phone surveillance and uh, data comes from the cell phone towers, triangulated because uh, cell phone operators, telecom operators do have multiple towers and they can triangulate you with some precision. It's not very good, but it's good enough to know whether you're, for example, moving from one tower to another. And it's the precision is pretty much enough for monitoring compliance, but uh, not much more. So for example, you can't detect whether two people met using that kind of data. So it's not good for proximity tracing or contact tracing. There's limited privacy. Uh, there are a lot of discussions around uh, the surveillance capacities of that data. And I will get back to you uh, on that on, in story three, so stay tuned. The second uh, interesting idea was how to avoid crowds. And uh, there, the idea was that, okay, so for example, I want to go walking in the park. Could I get a heat map of how many people are in that park or in that area of 
public forest or in that sporting grounds, in those sporting grounds and so on. There we need more precision. Uh, we should do GPS because otherwise it's just, you know, the cell tower triangulations are not precise enough. And uh, the there the idea would be that citizens would voluntarily opt in to that kind of tracking. Somebody would track them and uh, then tell them whether somebody, many people are already where they want to go. And that's very similar to something like uh, Google Maps or Apple Maps or the other applications do. They paint the roads with congestions red. And that is done by tracking some people and telling you um, what is, um, uh, what's the like aggregated number of people at that location? So it's sort of okay, uh, but I don't remember many of those applications really like taking off or becoming wildly popular. Uh, some were proposed also in the Estonian hackathons at the time. The third idea was proximity tracing. So can we somehow improve the state of uh, contact tracing? Because at some point humans will not have the there's not going to be enough humans to do it uh, with high enough infection rates. So that's where the whole um, mobile phone, Bluetooth um, proximity tracing idea came from. And the idea was to break transmission chains. Because the um, problem with COVID is that you're already infectious uh, during the period when you still don't have symptoms. That's for a few days. But you still can't go on and infect meaning that if you get symptoms and then you stay home, self-isolate, it might be too late because you may have already infected like three to five to 10 to, I don't know how many people, if you went to a nightclub, probably 50. Um, the problem is you don't know. And in that, uh, in that regard, trying to stay one step ahead means that people who get notified of potential contacts should also self-isolate. That has been the policy. And uh, Bluetooth technology was, I would argue, the most successful of all the different contact tracing technologies uh, due to its sheer number of rollouts. Other ideas were to use GPS, again, just you know, track where everybody is going and then tell that, yeah, you were close to somebody. Norway did that. Qatar did that and Kuwait did that. Then Amnesty International wrote the report that Norway, Qatar and Kuwait are tracking people via GPS. And then Norway suddenly didn't want to be in that list and they dropped that and uh, dismantled the whole app and threw it away and built one based on Bluetooth. So the good thing with Bluetooth is that Bluetooth doesn't give you absolute position, meaning that it's not a surveillance capacity like uh, cell phone surveillance or GPS. However, it's sort of um, radio capacity, meaning that you know how close people have been. So a lot of research got done on how to measure Bluetooth signal strength and how to uh, measure, uh, how to make that epidemiologically relevant. Uh, the result was that uh, you, it could work with certain possibilities. You had false positives, you had um, true positives, and as usual, you have measurements, you have an imprecise system and it works. But the question that um, became important and that caused a lot of arguments among researchers and which actually brings us to the topic of this lecture is, um, should the government know who, who was in touch with whom? Should the government get the social graph of people? And um, uh, Singapore was the first country successfully rolling out Bluetooth-based contact tracing, and they went with the solution where the government would know uh, who has been talking to whom. And they also had the, all the identities bound up with the phone number, so they had this all identified properly as well. Uh, in, initially, it was said that no, it will only be used for uh, epidemiological statistics. Uh, but about a year later, uh, there were reports that this data was actually being used in police investigations, uh, breaking the previous promise of using it only for epidemiology, which again brings here the topic that if you build infrastructure that makes it easy to perform certain kinds of uh, data analytics or surveillance, then somebody might come in the future and they might repurpose it for their own 
needs. And uh, that's exactly what happened in Singapore, where infrastructure that was promised to be used only for epidemiology was later reused for also uh, solving crimes. And yes, I'm, that's a wholly interesting discussion on, I like national security. I would also prefer if uh, murderers get caught and all of that. So I'm not against, I'm not anti-law enforcement. Uh, no, nowhere near that. But the question is how easy does it make abuse and misuse if you have an easy to use infrastructure that can be easily repurposed. So the, so the second, um, implementation was done slightly differently. There, all the identifiers were generating generated on the phones themselves. And the idea was uh, developed simultaneously by a number of people, uh, but the most famous, I guess, internationally implementation was the one by a Swiss uh, university, EPFL, Ecole Polytechnique, um, I forgot the, F now, Lausanne. Uh, and they built a system called the Distributed Privacy Preserving Proximity Tracing, uh, acronymed as DP3T, where all the identities would be mm, generated on phones, not by the service provider, the government. And there was a clever protocol which would um, allow you to uh, only so the government would only learn something about the people who have confirmed infections. And it works very similarly. Uh, if you ever use the Estonian Hoya app or uh, uh, German Corona Baron or any of the other tens of apps that are there in this Europe, then it works like this, that every day you are downloading uh, very well protected anonymous identifiers from the service provider. And then you use a lot of clever cryptography to see if you match one of those identifiers, if you have ever met them. But it's a one-way function, meaning that you can't turn it backwards. You can't get it, you, you can't know who you've met. And um, there is a lot of security analysis done on that. And you could possibly improve on the security guarantees but then you would make the protocol more complex. And what DP3T currently has it, it has over a hundred million installations easily counted, even in Europe. Uh, there's also implementations in the US and in other countries across the world. And probably, I guess there would be about 200,000, 300, sorry, 200 million, 300 million installations. And that happened for an interesting reason that uh, Apple and Google picked this system up and built it into their Android and iOS systems. So um, the whole discussion of should we get efficiency analytics for contact digital contact tracing? Uh, that was a strong discussion even in Europe. In Europe, Germany, France and UK wanted more data to understand transmissions to build epidemiological models. This protocol didn't allow it. Apple and Google didn't allow governments to get the social graph. So the English folks figured out some sort of a, they built some sort of a telemetry system which gave them something. And uh, so the British actually have written the best uh, efficacy analysis papers on the whole digital contact tracing system. Uh, estimating that there were thousands, tens of thousands lives saved during the pandemic thanks to digital contact tracing. There aren't equivalent studies for others because exactly that the whole thing was built without telemetry. So Apple built a system which would allow you to get uh, some privacy preserving telemetry using similar kind of technologies like ShareMind, uh, somewhat simpler, easier to deploy. And it would give you even um, some simpler things like how many notifications were given, because in Estonia, we don't even know that because we didn't build that part of telemetry. So uh, that led to a creation of public opinion that the system doesn't work. 
And it was a mistake that we didn't build even privacy preserving telemetry into this, we should have. Uh, just to prove efficacy, to show that something is working. Yes, we did have high level, case, high level cases where like members of the European Parliament or governmental officials got notifications from their Hoya apps and told others about it. So we know that it worked, but we don't know how well it worked. So in the government, when it, the time comes to measure what kind of measures work, then this one will uh, not have numbers next to it, meaning that it's hard to argue how well it worked. Um, my current position remains that uh, when we compare it to uh, total lockdowns, then it's um, less expensive than total lockdowns. Uh, it was built very cheaply based on some open source, rolled out as a free app. So uh, marketing was probably the highest cost, really. And, um, and the cost of lockdowns were like counted in percentages in GDP. Uh, gross domestic product, meaning that uh, there is a total different range of uh, costs, possibly also a different um, efficacy percentage. Possibly when we want to like really cut transmissions and lockdowns remain an effective tool, but whether they remain um, <laughs> budgetary effective is a different topic, right? In that regard, um, England actually had pretty good results because they didn't have large lockdowns and their contact tracing apps picked up everyone who went to the pub on a Friday night because people went to the pub on a Friday night Then Bluetooth signals worked marvelously inside pubs. So possibly they also had better efficacy and Estonia where we had more lockdowns didn't. But a lot of this I'm telling you right now is again, speculation based on um, seeing being next to the system and its development for the last year and a half. I don't have numbers for you. So here is one place where uh, we could have made policy decisions better by having better measurements. And actually, when we were planning the app in Estonia, the Ministry of Social Affairs actually put together, they planned the studies, the efficacy studies, but because of the lack of resources, nobody ever did them. Uh, in Switzerland, they did like sampled studies for efficacy. And these were also very helpful, but they weren't like population level telemetry studies. So um, we did, we do, there is a paper where we figured out how do you measure these kinds of systems. So for example, uh, there were other measurements. In other countries where you had these COVID codes, Whenever you got te positive test results for COVID-19, you got a number, the number you had to put into your app and that confirmed that you were infected. The Estonian system was slightly different. In Estonia, you would take your phone, you would authenticate against the national e-health record, which knows if you have a positive test result. And then through some cool pseudonymous protocols, you would again confirm it to the back end, And then the notifications would happen. In Switzerland, in early days, about 80% of the COVID tests did not give you a COVID code, meaning that even if you got a positive test result, you couldn't participate in digital contact tracing. In Estonia, all 100% of COVID tests were immediately eligible for use, but here we had a different uh, bottleneck, which was the availability of digital identity. Not everybody has one especially people under 13 uh, who can't legally have one. So if you um, wanted to have like proxy infection confirmations, and these were rolled out just a few months ago, uh, not initially. So uh, Switzerland, uh, not everybody got to confirm because the test result testing system is wasn't, was very federated in Estonia. Not everybody got to confirm because not everybody had digital ID and these are wildly different uh, reasons. So we did write a paper on how to measure the efficacy of digital contact tracing and what are the metrics which, that you should follow. Uh, we're yet to see any studies uh, produced under this methodology, but uh, maybe one day. I'll so actually skip. just then. Yes. If I think it would be good if you can leave some 15 minutes for, for discussion. So that would be in about four to five minutes. Yeah? Yes, I will skip that part that uh, we can have later. So human mobility, another thing that uh, companies started doing in 
in the time of COVID was whether people are, whoever had location data available quickly said that we can now use it to uh, predict uh, COVID movements or analyze COVID movements. Google Maps did it and the Estonian government also wanted to do it. The Statistics Estonia wanted to do it based on mobile phone location data collected from telecom operators. There were a few concerns. Uh, tele, uh, Statistics Estonia doesn't have yet the full legal basis for mobile phone location data. And um, that's one reason for that is that there are a lot of research results suggesting that you can't properly anonymize it. Uh, that's a discussion for another day. But what they've worked out in the end was that with a lot of pre-aggregation done at the telecom operators, they could still do it in a way that allowed you to say that, okay, uh, there were this percent more people were staying home in this re these regions. And that was actually done. Uh, so that was a good example of how you could deploy technical innovations uh, to do this. And that was actually done, uh, you just re-engineered a new statistical uh, uh, framework for that. And it was very federated. Telcos did a lot of heavy lifting and Statistic Estonia just combined the results. However, uh, if you don't want to force the telcos to do the heavy lifting, and if you want to change the methodology later, then uh, you would need something different. And there we have done some work building a new kind of uh, share mind, which actually works on much larger data sets. We have built a number of numerous applications on that. Uh, Indonesian telcos have used it to uh, do an analysis of roaming customers. So how many people uh, doing roaming in one network are doing it for the other? The end user was the Indonesian Ministry of Tourism who wanted an estimate on how many people are entering Indonesia as tourists based on ca counting the roaming phones. But if you count them from one telco and then from the other, you might get some are, you might get double because they might be in both networks. So you needed a set intersection of how many were in one and the other. Uh, we've also built with Positium, an Estonian mobility analytics company, a system where uh, we actually got the same analysis done for Estonia. So where do Estonian tourism's, tourists come from? And these were aggregated, like the raw uh, telecom records were aggregated on uh, ShareMind and then sent to Positium's visualization system. I'll skip the demo uh, due to a lack of time. And our most recent result in this domain is um, we just uh, published about a week or two ago, our European Statistics Office Eurostat published a result of our year and a half long study on how to properly uh, anonymously analyze mobile phone location data with a nice 71 page privacy impact assessment, uh, mostly written by Trin Seal again. And that is something where we feel that there is a great chance of innovation because based on this, we could be, we could pro uh, protect mobile phone location data way better than we could before. So we, um, hopefully soon we will be able to run um, pilots with actual European telecom operators. Uh, result, these uh, results are public as well. I can provide links. To conclude, Already in 2016, we saw that um, uh, the study we had done on tax and education data, that could be a service, that could be a part of the e-government. The figure on this uh, comes from the PhD thesis of uh, one of my students, Rivo Dalviste, uh, who suggested that actually you could have uh, the kind of uh, X-Road security servers that are um, uh, doing transactions, uh, transaction translation and being gateways for transactions could also be gateways for secure computing studies. If you want certain data from a certain uh, agency, then the X-Road security server knows the data structures internally anyway. So it could act as an interface used to query information. And it could do the same on-premises cryptography application that we did initially, but with custom tools. So uh, this year we did an extra, another follow-up to Rivo's uh, study back then. 
And we found some use cases in healthcare elsewhere. And we believe that in the maturity model of e-governments uh, that we are building across the world in Africa and elsewhere, there might come a day when this happens. Whether we'll get it to be in the future X-Road roadmap is something we'll see in the coming years, but we are certainly continuing the development of uh, integration of these technologies so that secure computing or big data analytics, which has not been a feature of X-Road, could be uh, in the future. Thank you. That is, uh, that is all. Thank you, Dan. Fantastic to hear all your insights. And uh, we already have a number of, of uh, questions coming forward. And uh, I would like to ask uh, Mikkel to go first, please, Mikkel. Yes, uh, thank you, Dan. Um, actually, a very practical question, um, because I've been involved in a project where this, this chairman was a bit sort of tested on certain applications. A problem we face there is not only that, let's say, data needs to be merged, which otherwise cannot be merged, but also that uh, we need to be able to see this data on people who might not necessarily be the subjects of certain, I don't know, services or something like that. For example, like, I mean, you need to have data on healthy people uh, in order to predict uh, uh, certain disease, let's say, risks. So you need to have both ones and zeros. Uh, I understand that chairman would actually be a solution there because certain institutions cannot see this data on people who are not actually subject to their services. Uh, could be done. Uh, uh, you're developing it actively in, in, in directions that would basically support all these different analytical techniques that are needed there. So would that be a scalable model for these type of situations as well? Because a very on a very practical level, especially different state institutions, I don't know, the police or, 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 or rescue board or whatnot, need to see essentially population level information in order to do the very targeted specific yes. uh, intervention. Excellent question, Michael. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll, uh, I, I skipped that part today because again, uh, 45 minutes. Uh, we did a project with GlaxoSmithKline, big pharma company, who has, uh, okay, let's, rewind a bit. There are things called rare diseases, about 8,000 of them, which are rare in the sense that Estonia maybe has two or three cases. The world maybe has 100,000. Question is, what's the financial incentive for uh, developing drugs for those? Because, hey, you're not developing a drug for three people, right? You might develop some treatment. That's why treatment of rare diseases is so expensive. You read about it in the news, there's pill, pill costs 25,000 euros, one pill, and you need one every month or one every week. It's insane, you can't really. And the problem is that if some of these rare diseases are treated incorrectly, they might also lead to complications uh, where you need to start taking care of the person and the uh, ongoing health system cost is going to be high. So what if, we could find rare diseases early through the kind of uh, sieve studies we currently use for uh, uh, breast cancer, uh, for uh, this, uh, for, uh, the words elude me right now. Uh, there, there are several studies, um, uh, you can, you, you get these sort of um, check-ins based on your age, where the government basically asks you to come in and check for certain kinds of developing cancers to get them early. So for that, they need to actually see you, uh, maybe get a, do something with you, get a procedure. But a lot of it we could actually do based on existing health records. For example, the Glaxo case was based on asthma. Asthma has a rare form called severe eosinophilic asthma which looks the same, but doesn't um, respond to normal treatments. It needs a special kind of treatment, some biological treatment, a special kind of uh, drug, which several pharmas actually make. But the problem with those pharmas is they can't find the patients because general practitioners aren't capable of diagnosing this and not all pulmonologists are capable of diagnosing this. And uh, a person with asthma might get away for several years before it gets detected. So, however, uh, these people might have blood work done. They might have different tests done. These are in the e-health record. So in a setting like Estonia, 
we could actually do a query on this to find people who are, according to a specific clinical algorithm, which has been tested in clinical trials and all of that. So not just, you know, randomly running queries on everybody, but an actual clinical procedure and clinical formula would find people with a risk, a high risk of having actually a rare form of asthma. And now we get to the interesting part, intervention. And this is, I believe, the thing you also ran into in the e-government and the AI thing. And we ran into the same thing with the Glaxo project. We had a lot of lawyers working on that one. Can you do interventions? And uh, there's an ethical thing. Should you tell a person that uh, they have a disease? And this is what the Genome Center in Estonia has been running into for the last 20 years. Some people don't want to know. I might have a hereditary disease. I might die when I'm 30, but I don't want to know. That's one thing. So first of all, that's the one thing to consider. The second is under GDPR, in certain cases, your personal doctors who have a close relation to you might be able to, might have a legal basis for processing that information. So one option would be to, if it's your pulmonologist who tells you that, if you are, if you've gone to that pulmonologist a number of times, then there is a paper, there was a master's thesis, uh, which learned also from our GSK study. I, I don't remember who wrote it, but it was, I think, done last year or this year. Uh, but there is a master's thesis done in Estonia by someone who worked for Sorain. And I think that uh, you might, might be able to draw that idea that if it's like a GP or your a pulmonologist who tells it to you, then that's a sort of a less of a problem. Uh, but that is tricky territory and might not work for things like rescue boards or other stuff. So the intervention has to be given to you by someone who you have a close relation with. Uh, it's sort of, a, sort of a rule of thumb. And there we also plan to use share. We did a share mind the prototype because the idea again was that you would run it on the whole population, which means that you want to make it less scary, less creepy, right? And but share mind doesn't solve ethics. That's an important thing to know. Uh, technology doesn't solve ethics. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Vincent, you're next. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very, very much for a very interesting presentation. I have more of a political question, perhaps. And just to introduce my question, um, a lot of universities are nowadays, nowadays using uh, devices to monitor how many students are in a room. Um, and I know various cases where these devices were in fact um, demolished by students because they didn't like them. And in fact, at Leiden University, there was a protest against these devices because students thought that they were being monitored and their gender was registered and the way they uh, were active or not active in classrooms were, could be detected, et cetera. So they, uh, well, there was a huge uh, row at Leiden University and uh, well, almost the day after the system was uh, not being used anymore. Mm -hmm. um, now, this is just the introduction. We are living in, in strange times where people don't trust governments and don't trust technologies. And I was wondering whether you came across this issue and how you think you can perhaps counteract uh, distrust in technologies. And um, well, the, the in between uh, the lines question is, do protocols and, and measures and, and encryption are they persuasive, persuasive enough to fight this trust of citizens? Great question. Two things. First of all, uh, we did that in a, we tried to solve the whole internet of things and the smart building security uh, with some US universities, one of the DARPA projects that we did. There was a precisely the same thing. Smart building wants to uh, save on power, uh, power usages. So you have sensors detecting whether people are in the room. If they're not, you maybe don't do ventilation. You close down the lights, all of that. But the question is that are the sensors good enough to detect a lot more? So who is in the room with whom? What are they doing? Blah, blah, blah. So uh, there were some technology ideas coming out of that, uh, but you need to still do the societal work. You still need to talk to the people. Um, 
with the uh, Hoya app, the contact tracing thing, the government ran a survey among people. Security was the number one concern, but uh, it wasn't significant enough. It was like maybe uh, up to 10% were worried. Uh, for for uh, the question then becomes, what is what's the mat mat uh, maturity of the society? And uh, I would like to draw a parallel to the excellent work on social aspects of internet voting, which uh, the university team has been performing for the last decades, uh, where if you talk, if you talk, if you make things transparent, it helps, but it doesn't solve. It doesn't solve. And uh, at some point you need some infrastructure in place to actually reap the benefits, meaning that Possibly if you are rolling out something like this, then in the rollout phase, you want to be as transparent as possible. You want to show that if you just say, oh, we will anonymize the data, that's just bull, sorry. Uh, this is being recorded, so I won't say what that is. But uh, if you somebody just says, we'll anonymize it, not saying how they will do it, then it's usually false information because a lot of people are just saying that we'll anonymize it. And then what they do is re they remove maybe the personal code or they remove the names and births of birth dates. And that's not enough in some cases. There are people who know good anonymization. Data scientists and statisticians are often very good at that. So I'm not arguing that it's impossible. I'm arguing that in communication, it's hard and I teach a privacy technology course. And in the first lecture, we usually take some news items and then ask the students to think, so here they say that it's an anonymization. How do you think they could have done that, whether it works? So be very transparent when you're rolling out. And uh, later, you still need to be transparent, but uh, possibly less so. And here we get to another ethics thing. So are you rolling out something because of extraordinary circumstances, like a pandemic? And then when you say that we're just doing it for the time of the pandemic, so how do you know that the pandemic is over? Uh, because why is the pandemic over right now? If we were, um, if we created special uh, data analysis systems like two years ago, then would we stopping them now or would we not? The situation has obviously changed, but uh, will the pandemic ever be over is the question to ask. So the question is that if you justify data, data collection by, needing to save energy and you say that this is going to be there forever then obviously be transparent about that as well is uh, the guideline not like to you but to anyone uh, listening so that was sort of uh, my insights on that thank you great so uh, i have as a maybe as a last question unless there is one coming from the participants so we have this uh, uh presentation great presentation from Mikkel on the prevalent study Right. And so one of the things that he shared with us was, you know, at the beginning, we had that expectation that we would be able to predict who will catch COVID. Now, so how many will we have in the future? But then actually it turned out during the during uh, executing the study that uh, COVID is very much down to social relationships and where who you have contact with rather than uh, and, and you're not sampling that, obviously. Right. By with, with the uh, with the with the method. So. Do you know, or could you think of an anonymous social network that will allow for such an analysis? We thought about that when we were developing the DP3T with a Swiss team. Uh, we thought about we, uh, social network analysis is again problematic because graph isomorphism are a powerful tool. Meaning that if you have um, if you have a subset graph of a social network, then you can very successfully place it within the social network, leading to potential re-identification in the presence of auxiliary data. Consent, yeah. Uh, what the best we came up with, and I wasn't fully pleased with that. I thought that we might do better. Was that uh, if you are marking yourself, if you're confirming your a disease in the app, you could also say that, the, is it okay if I share my social network data, my like contact data with epidemiologists for research purposes? And if there would be opt-in consent, then that could be done. And that was the best we came up mm. back then. Okay. 
there were some other ideas, uh, private set intersections, but these were still expensive cryptographically. So I don't think they were rolled out anywhere. Great. Sorry. Fully understood. Could, yeah. Okay, so then as we are, uh, as we reach the end of time, we uh, kind of, we want to wish you a nice lunch, everyone together. So uh, thanks again, Dan, for joining us today. And we're looking forward to the next uh, yes. continuation of our series and we wish you the best of luck. Thanks Always happy to talk to people who understand people better than computers. We are better, <laughs> might be at computers, but your, your research very critical also for this kind of work we're doing. Thank you very much. Thanks. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.